Hi everyone, you're watching Bread and Roses. I hope you're fine. I'm Mariam Namazi. And I'm Fari Wurspuya. In this week's program, we're going to be talking about the visit of Swedish ministers, of feminist ministers to Iran, and they're wearing the veil there, something that has exploded on social media. We'll also be talking about an insane fatwa of slaughtering a goat in goat. front of a PIA airlines about to take off in order to ensure its safety and our slice of life is the wonderful day without immigrants this nationwide protest against trump's xenophobic policies and the interview this week is with rahila gupta on what's happening in rojava equality of men and women it's raining women stay with us don't go away As you know, last week, Sweden had a delegation that visited Iran to talk about trade and business and so on and so forth. And we know that there's uh, photographs that Twitter and social media went crazy over where you see, you know, a line of Swedish ministers, uh, you know, the feminists, uh, first feminist government of Sweden, them wearing the, the veil and also sort of bowing down to the regime's leaders. And it was something that really, oh, it just mm. makes you feel sick, really, and when you see actually, that. Actually, the response of people uh, in, you know, to this delegation and the way they behaved in Iran, rightly so, criticized the Swedish government that the, you know, the standards is driven by the profit margin. The only thing was important for them was to trade uh, negotiations. They were prepared to undermine every single declared principle of the Swedish government and supposedly the feminist of in the feminist. power exactly. and the government in Sweden. I mean, especially when you think, you know, the fact that you see Anne Lind, you know, the trade minister, she's sort of bowing down like this with her hand to her chest because the male uh, members of the Iranian regime will not shake hands with a woman because women are seen to be the sources of chaos and fitna. So she's already basically said that she accepts that. Wearing the veil, you know, again, because women are seen to be the source of chaos and fitna if they're not properly veiled. And this despite the fact that there's such a huge unveiling movement in Iran, a movement against compulsory veiling and the sort of, you know, view of women as second class citizens. Yeah. Despite that, here you have feminists siding with Iranian regime's laws rather than the women who are dissenting yeah. and resisting. And, and, and I think we need to insist, these are state feminists. These are feminists who only, the feminism is the operation of the state and the interest of the state. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the true woman's uh, right activists and, you know, uh, feminists who actually fight for equality of men and women would not accept that. She was saying, what did you expect us to do? Either break the law. Yes, that's what we expected Yes, break to do, the law. Break or the law. send a male delegation. No, actually there was a third alternative to refuse to go and say we would not go to Iran because of the gender inequality that is state in Iran and imposing the segregation between men and women is imposing. That was the alternative. Many other have done that. Look at the chess champions who refused to go to Iran mm -hmm. as a sign of solidarity with the Iranian woman and refusing to accept the gender segregation. Yes, that's one alternative. And yeah, they, and also, I mean, it, it's sort of like, you know, well, what, what do you do if you've got a racial apartheid regime in South Africa? Well, don't do business with it, boycott it. Don't conform to a system that allows for segregation based on races. Why do you accept it based on sex? And especially when you look at the issue of the veil, I mean, the veil has been imposed in Iran and in many societies through brute force, by throwing acid in women's faces, by trying to completely erase women from the public space. And then you have feminists wearing it to do business as usual without any concern for women's rights and women's equality. And, you know, it's sort of a slap in the face of Iranian women who've been fighting against it for so many decades. Yeah, and, and this is it. This actually is consistent. Um, Swedish government... Uh, have been selling out women in the communities in Sweden to the Islamists. You know, they have not been defending women's rights in Sweden, 
within the circled communities and actually given a free hand to the Islamists is a reflection of exactly the same hypocritical and double standard that run in the in the Swedish society and in the foreign policy actually. These are state feminists who the only interest they have is the profit margin and that's why they need to be ashamed of themselves. Recently, I interviewed journalist Rahila Gupta about her visits to Rojava, Syria and Kurdistan and the project of gender equality that's taking place there. You know, something that she says is basically that it's raining women in Rojava, which is a great expression, isn't it? Mm, I agree. And you see, you see amongst, you know, the area which is a lot of conflict, there is war, areas has been surrounded by various types of Islamists from Idbil to ISIS and on, on the other side you have Assad and uh, you know you have Turkish sort of troops area which has been s surrounded and people sort of the liberated areas um, backed by the uh, uh, Kurdish um, women fighters and you, you'll have the uh, you know equality of men and women enshrined in every level of um, administration of government. Yeah, I mean, it's amazing when you see the sorts of progress that they've made in a very, very short time. You know, it, it reminds me of those sort of the, the comments we often hear. Well, you know, we can't deal with women's liberation now. We've got more important tasks at hand. And it shows how it is possible to deal with so many different issues at various levels, but also to insist on gender equality. Yeah, and there are uh, people who uh, point to the criticism of PKK and the, the fact that there are no other political parties being allowed to operate in, in those areas and there's limit limited amount to our political activity or freedom of political activity um, you know th these are important issues that we need to look at however where in an area where gender inequality has been undermined by every single state in that area every single you know Islamist group in that area somebody comes and raised the banner of women equality men and women equality and the fact that you know half of a society has exactly the same right as the other half that needs to be said that specific point needs to be supported and in this program, we do. Yeah, definitely. Stay with us and watch this really interesting interview with Rahila Gupta. Don't go anywhere. Um, Rahila Gupta, it's a great pleasure to have you on our program. You've been to Rojava, you've written about us. Tell us how such a project for gender equality can be possible in such difficult circumstances. Yeah, well, that's a question I asked myself as well before I actually made the trip to Rojava. And it really is something, if you've never heard about it before, it's something that you wouldn't believe. Uh, that was my initial reaction. Um, and I think I was probably one of the last journalists to be able to cross the border because all the borders are shut as well. So it's very, very isolated. Um, and what I found was really amazing. Um, I, there is um, an experiment that's going on in radical democracy. So it's, um, it's about direct participatory democracy. So neighborhoods form into communes and every, and, and every commune is led by a man and a woman. And there are several committees on that. So it'll, there'll be a committee to deal with health issues or education or what they call conflict resolution, which is often to do with domestic violence. And each of those will be led by a man and a woman. And then it goes upwards to the next level and the next level and the next level up to the city level. Um, and, and they all elect the next uh, level of leadership. Parallel to this, so there is this uh, whole system that you know, energizes society, is a whole autonomous women's structure as well, which makes sure that there's a feminist perspective on every single issue. And they have the same structure. So they have, but except that it is women only, so they will have, you know, committees at the neighborhood level and right up to the city level. Um, so if you talk in terms of, you know, uh, in order to make sure that there is gender equality, do you tilt the field in favor of women? Yes, you do. You have to. Now, this is going on in the middle of war. Syria, as everybody knows, is completely war-torn. What do we hear 
about this place. I mean, I am shocked by the level of ignorance about Rojava in the West, amongst progressive people, amongst politically active people. Partly it's to do with the fact that the media is not interested. When I was crossing the border, I met journalists who were going straight to the front line because what they want is war, brutality, violence. And there is a society behind all of this, which is really, I would argue, the most radical uh, democracy, attempt at building a radical democracy in the world. And so it takes you back on many different fronts because, you know, there's the whole kind of clash of civilizations narrative in the West, you know, that there is this monolithic Islamic backward culture and you have, you know, all the, the best values in the world are attached to Western civilization, respect for democracy, human rights, equality, etc, etc. And then here you have in Syria a part of uh, it. So I have to tell you the geographical, it's, it's the northernmost strip of Syria going from east to west and it's kind of bordering the Turkish, uh, the, the southern part of Turkey. And on their south, they are facing the ISIS uh, so-called caliphate. And, and one of the reasons uh, that we sometimes um, hear about them in the West is because we see the women's defense forces out there fighting the good fight against ISIS. Now, they've been the most effective fighting force against ISIS. So they've had uh, the advantage of American air cover. But, you know, it's America has uh, a particular uh, project there. It wants to get rid of ISIS. Um, and so the, the support that it's giving Rojava is very, very qualified. And what's going to happen, I, I suspect, I fear, is that all of these people are, as soon as the war against ISIS is won, and the Rojava forces will win this uh, fight. Uh, they have been incredibly disciplined. Um, they are very reliable. There is none of the ragtag internecine fighting of the rest of the Syrian rebels. Um, there is none of the um, kind of conservative uh, religious, you know, uh, ideology driving. This is a totally secular um, uh, state, and I'll come to that in a in a little while. So basically, they that that is one of the reasons we've heard a little bit about them is because they have this effective fighting force against ISIS, and they are moving on Raqqa as we speak. Apparently, it's entered the third stage. So, but once ISIS goes. Um, what could have been a model solution for the rest of Syria if there were these self-governing administrative areas like the ones that have been set up in the north across Syria where the local people themselves could participate in the whole political process and decision making, I think we would have a way forward. But I think it's too dangerous uh, as, a, as an idea because it's anti-capitalist. It's uh, very, very into uh, sustaining the, um, talking about sustaining the environment and taking ecologically sound decisions. Um, and all of this is, uh, I mean, people ask, so how did this come about? You know, why, why did this happen? How come? So it really is um, the one unsung example of the success of the so-called Arab Spring, because um, in 2011, when, when there were all these uh, uprisings across the Middle East, similar uprising took place amongst the Kurdish community in, uh, in the northern part. And um, because Assad was very keen on uh, focusing his firepower on the rebels in the south, he basically left them to get on with it. When you talk about how the system is set up, but what are some practical ways in which women's rights are being protected and promoted? Okay, well, the Women's Ministry only set up in January 2014, and since then they have abolished um, 
dowry, they've abolished polygamy, they've abolished or criminalized or banned forced marriage, honor killings. Um, the, the Sharia uh, system has been disbanded. It's the only part of Syria in which the Sharia courts have been totally disbanded because you've got the Sharia system under the Syrian rebels and you've also, and Assad, for Assad, that was the way in which he delivered justice to all his religious minorities. So that's been abolished. And what I thought, particularly as an Indian, I thought one of the things which is really interesting Interesting was not just ending forced marriage, but criminalizing anybody who stops a woman getting married of her own free will. You know, so a so-called love marriage, if that is stopped in its tracks, that person, their family would be criminalized. So these are quite amazing things. And when I met um, a group uh, called Sara, which I suppose the closest um, in the parallel would be South Hall Black Sisters, um, they were saying that since all the legislation had passed, they thought, felt that, you know, violence against women had halved. So they're saying, none of them are saying that we have arrived Everybody talks about the thousands of years in which patriarchy has been entrenched. But you know, the, in, it's so, in so many different ways. I mean, I, when I was there, I was hosted by different families. So every night I spent a different night in, with a different family. So I got to see, you know, families you know, and how they operated in quite an intimate setting. And, you know, one woman who had been married at the age of 14 and had seven kids and had been illiterate, um, was now, since the revolution, had been going to classes in Kurdish and she learned, so, you know, she could now read and write and when we were watching TV and if it was subtitled, she would delightedly point to the words and, you know, read them out. So, and, and, and then she also started, because her kids have all grown up now and she says, you know, I will never, I will never uh, force or ch choose their husbands for them, for the daughters, they can have their own marriages. Um, and she also does conflict resolution, so she goes off to her local commune <coughs> and will go and, you know, talk to families where there is violence and try and resolve it. And of course, if it's not resolved, then they have to go through the court system. Do you feel that this magnificent movement is getting the support that it needs from people who are progressive and living outside of Rojava in the West, for example? Well, I'm actually really disappointed by the uh, what I would have expected to um, from you know progressives to support this. Um, I've been really disappointed. So, for example, um, I think partly to do with the fact that they have had Rojava has had both the support of the Russian uh, army from time to time, as well as the Americans. Both of them, imperial forces, have made, have made the traditional left rather suspicious. As far as the Rojava people are concerned, they say, we have to take, we have to be practical, we have to take whatever support we can get. We do not have the armaments and, and we do not have, you know, basically the resources to fight somebody like ISIS, so we need to do that. Um, then I find that the feminist uh, movement, uh, although I find that particularly baffling, you know, so, so like the uh, Women's International Peace uh, League, um, they, they are uh, not supporting it and I can't actually get to the bottom of it. I mean, they're talking about the amount of Syrian women who are doing human rights work in the rebel areas and are disappointed that they have only 2% representation of women in the councils over there. And they're talking in terms of we should lobby the funders to pr make sure that aid is dependent on 30% uh, representation of women. So then I asked them, but in Rojava there's 40 to 50% representation of women without you know, conditionalities on aid. Why aren't you supporting that? And I think part of it is they cannot get their head around the issue of non-violence that, the, that they have faced, a tradition. they have supported a tradition of non-violence and seen militarization as something that is uh, masculine and, and have not fully understood that self-defense um, uh, is really important and that non-violence can be a privileged position for people who don't face that kind of dilemma. So you don't get you know, support from that group of people. Then you have other um, uh, commentators and left-wing uh, organization groups here who support the Syrian rebels. And when you ask them, but the Syrian rebels actually, you know, first of all, as we know that the rebel army is just a ragtag 
group of you know various Islamist uh, organizations and don't you think we ought to be confronting the fact that if these if these rebels were successful what kind of a post Assad society are we talking about you know where is your support for secularism and they are not prepared to um, counter to 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 understand uh, these issues all they see is Assad is a dictator we have to um, uh, you know unseat him in any shape or in any way we can and not really looking at who are the people who are doing the unseating and of course there are some groups <coughs> on the left that support the Assad regime yes but I guess the the main issue is Rojava is a it's rainy women you you say in one of yeah. your articles what I mean, I guess the question is, it, it does hold something really important and even as a symbol for what could possibly be in the Middle East and North Africa. It, could, it represents for the world. a different world. Yeah. I mean, even for the world. Yeah. I, I think that its ambitions and its aspirations are um, un, you know, unmatched. I think even in the West, we are simply do not have that level of ambition about uh, the kind of society we want to see. And I think it is such an important experiment. It is so important to support it that I really think, first of all, we need to spread the word. You know, people need to know about Rojava. But it requires, the kind of support it requires, I feel, is like lobbying at that level of, you know, Turkey needs to back off. But if Turkey has to back off, America has to put pressure on Turkey. What kind of an American president do we have at the moment? You know, it's like um, the, uh, there's about you know ten or fifteen foreign powers with the real interest in that area, which is what's making it really difficult to marshal support for Rojava. But as an idea, the fact that this experiment can be even tried in a war-torn area with no medicines, you know, shortage of food, all sorts of uh, issues and complications, people migrating into and leaving, you know, there's a huge amount of refugees coming in, nobody's paying um, as the blindest bit of heat to that. They need aid for that. You know, Mosul now that Mosul is um, coming, well, probably the war there is coming to an end. There are refugees entering Rojava from there. So they are facing a really difficult situation. And to, to be able to have this, you know, this, not just to say that another world is possible, but in fact that another world is here and we are making it and we are creating it. We, all of us, really need to support it. So I feel very passionate about Rojava. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. The insane fatwa of this week is from Pakistan and it's a story you might have heard where there was a plane crash of the Pakistan International Airways, PIA, and uh, when the first flight after the crash was given the go-ahead to go, you know, to, to go ahead and take off, uh, the staff decided just as an added safety measure that they would slaughter a goat Poor. right there on the runway. Poor yes. goat. Uh, Honestly, you, poor we can't goat. Show the pictures because it's just we feel really sorry for the goat. But you see, that's what is true. And, and for the poor PIA yeah. staff who thought that slaughtering yeah, a goat absolutely. would and be useful. And this is what religion is pushing, you know, sacrificing animals and praying mm. against science and safety checks. Mm. I think we want to put those in balance. Which one do you want to go for? I, I wonder mean, which. Yeah. Would what, anybody would be uh, prepared to go on a plane like, without safety checks? I'll choose the goat. Yeah. Let's let's sacrifice a goat. No, no I, I think, don't I think, think we're going to up for the for the safety for safety checks. checks. Yeah. And this is this is what the problem is: science and the proper management, and rather than sort of religion and sacrifice and praying, go for science, not the goat. The slice of life this week is of the 16th February protests in the United States, nationwide protests called A Day Without Immigrants. And it's a wonderful expression in resistance to Donald Trump's xenophobic policies, saying that immigrants are important, 
a day without immigrants would mean lots of places being shut down. A lot of businesses closed down, a lot of families uh, did not send the children to school and showed once again that what has made America great and will make America great are immigrants. Not and Donald it, Trump. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And not only in America, now globally everywhere. I think the, defending the rights of the immigrants and recognizing the role of immigrants play in every society is decides the soul of every uh, every country and globally i think that that's the key issue of the future of every society we've reached the end of our program we hope you enjoyed this week's program and we look forward to seeing you again at the same time and same place next week until then bye goodbye Hi, I'm Mariam Namazi. And I'm Fadi Bospuya. We're hosting a program called Bread and Roses. It's a weekly program that's broadcast in Persian and English in the Middle East and North Africa, primarily Iran as well. And it's also shown on YouTube internationally. And we've been doing this since last May. We're coming up to a year's anniversary. And yeah. we, we've had quite a lot of fun making these videos. We discuss taboo breaking, free thinking ideas. The Islamic regime of Iran has called us immoral and corrupt and that's why the, you need to support us we are and the vo alternative voice in Middle East and North Africa of corruption and immorality so do support us here's a short video from patreon that explains how you can help us with even just one dollar a week that's nothing support us patreon lets fans become patrons of their favorite artists and content creators it's different than Kickstarter because it's not about one big project that requires lots of funding. It's more for bloggers or YouTubers or web comics, anyone who creates on a regular basis. Here's how it works. When you become a patron, you're agreeing to give an artist a tip of an amount you set every time they release a piece of content, whether it's a new song, a video, or a recipe. You can set a monthly maximum to make sure that you're always within your budget. Choose an amount, enter your payment information, and you're done. Becoming a patron allows you to view and post in the artist's stream, and in exchange for your support, artists offer additional patron packages, which might include monthly Google Hangouts, music production tutorials, pre-sale concert tickets, or anything they can offer as a way to say thanks. Patreon, empowering a new generation of content creators.